While the ruse as a whole is being repaired, our pilot Marika, Austin, Ian, and Jason are doing a trade run to Brightly and back, and then they're going to do another run to Asheville to cover the rose while it's down. Some of the Rose's crew is signed on to assist as well. I did more meditation practice and detached again. Tried to stay out of the public eye and messed around to see what I could do. <laughs> Not much. Can't move anything solid. Not yet, anyways. After a while of wandering around the less traveled areas of the city, I kind of forgot that I wasn't in my body and paid a visit to Avery at the church. Half the attendees saw it as a sign. The others panicked. <laughs> Whoops. Avery stormed over afterwards and gave me a good talking to about, the, about doing that. I told her it was an accident. She thinks I'm running around impersonating a ghost to get my kicks in while we're hanging in town. Now I have to go over there and apologize. Why do you do this to me, Avery? Journal Entry 306 It's been a few days. DeHind is back from its trade runs. We made some nice profit. They also had a message. There's a general call for adventurers and mercenaries to Hebrew to join in defense against the undead. It sounds like people are starting to get worried about Wolf Lake. We all gathered up and had a long discussion. We are going to go. It's time we wrapped up this chapter of our lives. The university courses end in a few days. We're going to let our students finish and then we're heading off. We're going to sell tickets to any others who want to go along for the ride. I figure we can make it there in three or four days if we go a direct route instead of the week if we follow the trade path. Of course that means we'll be flying right over Wolf Lake. We can make some good recon while we're there. Avery is definitely coming with us. She says she'll have the church branch all sorted out by then. In the meantime, we're dumping as much information on the Master Artificer as we can in case we don't make it back. I can't believe how far we've come. It's almost two years now, and we're no longer scared. We've become powerful. We have pushed back. What has this world done to us? Journal Entry 307 I got a surprise visit from Reyna while I was traipsing about unattached. Apparently, I can communicate just fine, especially when I'm angry. She doesn't so much mind that we're dragging Marcus off to join the war. No, she wants the airship. She wants us to have the pilot fly it back to Alien once we get there. Why does a dragon want an airship? Well, she wants to use it for business. More greed, seriously. She's decided that because she's Marcus's wife, she and the baby own a percentage of it. And because all three of them combined make up a majority, she should get to decide what to do with it. Well, first of all, they never got married. Getting knocked up and churning out a baby is not marriage in my book. Fuck that noise. Oh, did she get pissed off? I think she was seconds from changing forms when Marcus showed up and defused the whole situation somehow. Whatever happened to the happy-go-lucky elf girl I remember? Was it all an act? Is she still under control of pregnancy hormones? Is it that time of the month for dragon women? Would dragon attacks even affect a psychic ghost? Journal Entry 308 I'm starting to grab up supplies for the trip. We're bringing enough ingredients to make one ton of black powder, but we're not mixing them until we get there. No need to be flying around with the world's largest bomb in our cargo bay. I also picked up some new armor and a new sword for emergencies and of course a new set of clothes. Austin is making some final adjustments to the ship, adding more lights and reinforcing the underside and landing struts. We've already sold out on tickets just from graduating adventurers who want to get in on the action or just want a shortcut to the main trade circuit. I made sure to mention that if anyone had any complaints, that they need to see Reyna. She'll handle all of that whether she knows it or not. In other news, Jason has apparently learned to just up and vanish. I can't tell he's around, he's just gone invisible. How the hell? Is that something he picked up off the spy master or just something the high-ranking members of his guild get? Journal Entry 309 
And we're off. The university students graduated last night, and we all took our three graduates and got smashed at the tavern. We gave them some new adventuring equipment for the war ahead, and then we got smashed again. A grand time was had by all, and I'm pretty sure the Central District got trashed from all the partying students. Come morning, Avery cleared us of our hangovers, we said goodbye to friends we made, and we hopped on the ship. It took a few hours for all our passengers to show up. Max's girlfriend is among the passengers. Lucky. We didn't overbook, luckily, and are still below our predicted maximum carry weight. It's more of an educated guess at this point. We lucked out though. The sky is clear blue and no clouds. We'll be flying over a few mountain ranges. We should make Wolf Lake in two days and Hebury in three if all goes to plan. For at most. In other news, the MP3 Golem is aboard somewhere. I've been hearing techno all day and it won't stop. Journal Entry 310 just as we were about to crest a mountain range and cross the Wolf Lake border, our mains went out. Luckily, the auxiliaries kept us up long enough for Austin to fix. Excellent work. Wolf Lake has changed since we were here last. The green plains are brown. All the settlements we passed were ruined or smoldering. We saw several groups of wandering undead milling about as we passed above. Stupid orcs. We could have won that campaign. We were so close. We were within sight of the city gates. We gave them what they needed. But no. So here we are again, and soon we'll be under the flag of Hebrew. Just as we put an end to the barbarian threat, we'll deal with this mess too. Even if I have to mind rape whoever is in command. Journal Entry 311. We made it to Hebrew today. The city was surrounded by refugee camps from Wolf Lake and had a large militia force hanging around the city. From the looks of it, the walls are being reinforced and we had spotted several new guard posts along the trade road, so they are preparing. Well, people were surprised when a new airship landed at the city air dock and wasn't carrying trade cargo. We unloaded our passengers and went around to check out the city. It looks like the tribal orcs finally retreated here. There are a lot of them around. Some of which I recognize, including one of Marcus's girlfriends. Whoops. Anyways, we all visited the tavern and had a nice cooked meal before looking around for whoever was in charge. Turns out they were looking for us to find out why a non-merchant airship had shown up and landed in their only dock. We introduced ourselves and got signed on for the campaign. The pay is good and the city is in much better condition than Winterfield was. No siege and open trade lanes with Ainfield and Rosenbridge by road, and river, and Ashvale by airship. I still get the feeling, in the back of my mind, that we're going to get stiffed like in Winterfield. But we made out pretty well afterwards, considering. Journal Entry 312 We've been moved in with the Mercenary Corps, a big series of tents on the south side of the city. There's about 5,000 or so here, I believe. Most of them Wolf Lake refugees. Quite a lot of orcs, goblins, wild elves, and some shifters mixed in with some random adventurers and swords. No standardized gear for us. We have to supply everything but tents, beds, and meals. I have noticed that even the guard are now using primitive stirrups on their horses. Looks like someone was quick to recognize their usefulness and copied them. I hung around with Ian and Jason and watched the militia training with them, using cavalry charges with long spears and horseback archers. I hope they realize that the arrows aren't going to stop the undead unless they're going to have all of them blessed. Speaking of that, Avery ran off to the local Sun Church branch and has been doing her thing. From what I've felt, they're not as bad as the alien or wolf lake branch were apparently, but needed work according to her thoughts. I don't know why she feels the need to do this though. Last I heard, the gods of this place don't really care what you do in their name. Maybe she's hoping to change that. Or maybe she already has. Journal Entry 313 Still no orders, so I took the day off and decided to look into the history of this town to see if it held any clues. 
We already know one Terran did settle down here eventually. I can see why. It's a nice place. Well, after some questioning from officials, the older records were stored in the Knowledge God's Church, in its library. I went with Marcus, Alex, and Jason, and with some skill talked our way in. Their library was a bit underwhelming, mostly city documents, old legal proceedings and census data, some history. We donated a copy of our Earth book and spent the rest of the day researching what was here. From what we gathered 400 years ago, there were several big wars going on. Humans seized control of Wolf Lake from the Orcs and Dwarves. A kingdom that used to border Winterfield was destroyed, sending its refugees to Aeon. The trade routes apparently didn't exist back then. Kingdoms were forced to be self-sufficient. Wars were happening all over. Then something changed. It started with sudden organization of religious cults into churches and the deployment of several super weapons by them. Aegon wasn't the only city to have a cannon. Hebri had one as well. According to the documents, it was later stolen and never seen again a century later. No one knew how to build another one or even make the powder to make it work anyway, so no one bothered investigating. It looks like the last group did deploy weapons. They just kept the knowledge of how to reproduce them to themselves. Unlike what we've been doing. Maybe it's time. Journal Entry 314 We finally got our marching orders. The mercenary corps leading the way for the militia and a long hard march down the trade road and into Wolf Lake. It took two days before we exited the valley. Since we have to move with the Corps, we had our pilot fly the Hind to meet us at the forts we stayed the night at. We're using the ship as a scout right now, performing wide concentric circles and keeping an eye out for the undead. Only a few small groups have been encountered, often wandering aimlessly until they spotted us. We've been cremating the bodies after we managed to make them stop moving. The militia has a large portable crematory just for the occasion. I think it's a little elaborate, but as long as I'm not the one pulling it. In other news, the MP3 Golem is following us. It's been playing Highway to Hell the entire time. The troops were spooked for a while, but then took it as a divine sign of assured victory. Journal Entry 315 I got a good look at our forces today. According to the General, we have around 20,000 troops, including the Mercenary Corps and twice that in support. We have troops borrowed from Rosenbridge, Wild Lake, Ainfield, and Zebron, as well as all the refugee tribes of Wolf Lake. I've never seen anything like it, not this big. Anyways, ran into the old Orc High Commander and we talked. I told him of our time in Winterfield and he told me what happened after they left. The undead kept out of the tribal territory for a month or so, then suddenly swarmed in overnight. Tribes on the borders were wiped out. By the time they got their army back together, it wasn't big enough to deal with the problem. Their explosives alchemist died trying to build a massive bomb to slow down the coming tide. Eventually, they were forced to leave the kingdom and moved into Hebrew, which took them in as long as they followed the laws and earned their food. When the call for mercenaries was sent, the remnants of the tribal army joined in to continue the fight. Unfortunately, they still don't see that we should have pushed the attack when we had the chance last year. Maybe I'm just bitter about it. Journal Entry 316 Our airship has spotted a large undead force about a day away. Of course, they'll be marching through the night, so we're moving to a spot where we should be able to meet them come morning. The general wants to use a modified phalanx, with the front lines armed with chopping weapons while the back line tries to keep the undead pinned with spears. He's also throwing spell slingers into what amounts to small testudo formations. The rest of us that aren't cavalry are being thrown into skirmishing groups under their own control. I'm putting Alex, Mike, and Max into the airship and they're going to strafe overhead with their area spells when they can. Once the battle gets too messy, they're going to come down and start laying down their smaller spells and defenses. We have whole teams of clerics, 
paladins and battle priests who will be lending their assistance in any way possible. Avery is off with them, leading her own team. I wish her the best of luck. Journal Entry 317 We got fucked. I should have seen it coming. So the undead arrive at first light. We're all ready for them too. The undead army had at least doubled in size since night fell. It looked like they were matching our numbers. It started well. The undead army looked to be mostly zombies and old beat up Wolf Lake militia armor. Jason said he saw a few living in the very back, probably the necromancers controlling the force. Our spell slingers opened with their volley. The hind did an overhead strafe, raining down fireballs and burning clouds. The undead charged in, a massive horde wave and crashed against the phalanxes. Skirmishers moved in and out. We were starting to take heavy losses. My abilities were of little use against the undead, so I tried hitting the necromancers in the rear while trying to push back the undead with my sword. The pistol wasn't of much use against the undead either. They kept coming, even without their heads. Twenty minutes into the fight, Avery suddenly goes supernova in the middle of the battlefield. I'm not sure what happened, but she got pushed, so she pushed back with everything. The entire field ignited. Everything dead burst into holy flames while us living were blinded. That is where it went wrong. The entire battlefield fell into a sinkhole. A sinkhole full of skeletons at least 10 feet deep. I don't know how it happened. Avery's light vanished amidst the chaos. All I know after that, I was told from the guys in the hind, I was knocked out. They saw her surrounded by necromancers amidst all the chaos, performing some kind of ritual. Alex and Max went ballistic and managed to blast the shit out of them from above. I came two hours later inside of a cave with the survivors. Apparently, the old dwarf mines run all over the place under the Wolf Lake Plains. The skeletons must have dug out the battlefield from under us. Jason managed to keep his footing and went around dragging us out. And with the rest of the surviving militia and mercenaries, they escaped through some mine shafts while the undead finished off anyone who stayed behind. I think I suffered a concussion, but a surviving clerics dealt with it. All of us Terrans seem to be okay except Avery is still out of it. We're not sure what they did with her or if we stopped them in time. The surviving army is withdrawing to the south of Wolf Lake and we're hoping we can avoid the undead while we recover. Journal Entry 318 Avery is back on her feet. She's feeling okay and nothing seems off except she can't manifest her divine spells anymore. We've all been trying to comfort her, but I can see it from her perspective, kind of. She had something more going on that I just don't have the context to describe, and now it's gone. I suggested that she return to Hiri for a few days, but she won't leave. She wants to be there by our sides, even if she, in her words, has been crippled. Of the great Hebrew army, only half of us remain. I think it's safe to assume that the rest have been absorbed into Wolf Lake's forces. The general is gone, and we're under control of one of his subordinates. We're working out a plan of attack. I've informed our new commander of the explosives we can make. We still have one ton of ingredients on the hind. We just need to know how they want it used. I brought in the old Orc High Commander, and he told his experience with our blast powder. I told him we could make big bombs or grenades. He wants grenades. We just need containers. He's written up the request, and the Hind has flown back to Hebrew with Mike and Jason to get the chemicals mixed and start production, while the city starts gathering as much of the ingredients as they can to produce more. In the meantime, we're going to start moving westward and we're going to watch our steps. Journal Entry 319 Hebrew is under siege. The undead started pouring out of caves in the valley along the Hebrew Wolf Lake trade road, often coming up behind the guard outposts that had been set up. If we had pulled a retreat after our first battle, we would have been cut off and finished. The news was delivered this morning from the hind. Our commander wants to push the fight now, 
Deciding that the young dead are distracted with the siege and wants to head straight for the capital and cut off the head of the serpent. We're on the march. We should arrive within sight in two days. I'm sending the hind to scout out ahead of us, report back, and then return to Hebrew. If production is stable, we should get our grenade shipment by tomorrow from the sounds of it. I've been spending more time with Avery. She needs the comfort. So far, she squared her shoulders, has been acting like nothing's wrong, but she's emotionally distraught. Like part of her was cut away. I'll see if I can hold up that part for her until she can do it on her own again. Journal Entry 320 While waiting for the hind to show, I was discussing the ship with the commander. He's none too thrilled that he doesn't have direct control over it, but won't outright say it. So he's asking me its carrying capacity and all of that, when suddenly the Rhine Graf spymaster, having apparently escaped the university, appears and stabs this guy standing next to me three times. Jason's on the hind, so he can't help. The commander's guards finally realize what's happening and tackle the guy to the ground and gut him. He vanishes. I look down at the guy he stabbed wondering why him, when I realize that it's me. I had detached and was watching myself bleed to death on the ground. I didn't feel anything. One of the camp clerics made it in time and manages to heal the wounds and has me move to one of the recovery tents because I'm not waking up. I realize that no one could see me and that realization suddenly made me visible. Everyone panics, thinks a ghost is attacking. Marcus realizes what's happening and manages to calm everyone down. A few minutes later, after some effort, I reattach and wake up in my body feeling weak and sore. <laughs> what the fuck? Anyways, we got our grenades from the hind and we did a demonstration of how to use them and how dangerous they are. Journal Entry 321 We're a day away from the capital. I ordered the hind to do a flyby of the city and report back. Well, they never managed to actually get over the city. They brought back photos. There's something standing in the middle of the city. We estimate that's at least 150 feet tall and human shaped. It's also partially transparent. It has gray skin and in every single photo, no matter the angle, its face was blurred out like a digital effect was used. They said it was standing stock still. We're going to hold position for 24 hours or until we can figure out what we're up against, whichever comes first. I've never seen anything like it and neither has anyone else in the camp. Anyways, I've taken to meditating again during our nights. Avery's joined with me, trying to make contact with her divine magic. She keeps saying that she can almost feel it, that it's just out of reach. In other news, even with all that going on, Mike and his talented girlfriend have gotten ever closer together, and Mike's starting to think of popping the question. It's on his mind constantly. Mike, if you read my journal anytime soon, she's going to say yes. Journal Entry 322 It's all about to start. Whatever that thing is, we're going to take it down. We can see it towering over the city walls in the distance. Its face is blurred out. When I stare at it for too long, it's like I can hear an all-consuming emptiness in my head that's threatening to pull me in. The clerics and paladins have gotten together, held a discussion, had some prayers, and think that it's a divine shell. Something that the god of undeath can be summoned into so he can manifest upon the world. Something that deities apparently can't do here on their own. Direct intervention. No avatars, no mortals to work through, totally hands on. The commander realizes how dangerous this is, and we're the only force out here. We're going forward with the attack, and we are going to go to the bitter end. We begin the siege within the hour. Soon as we begin, I'm going to have the hind, loaded with spell slingers, go over the wall and burn down the nobles' district with everything they got. 
and then start attacking the shell while the ground forces try and penetrate the main gate. Then, then we put an end to this nonsense. While I write this, the MP3 golem is running around the camp playing for whom the bell tolls. It's not helping my mood. Journal Entry 323 The attack began. We moved in for the city gate, guarded by at least a few thousand undead. Our archers, now grenadiers, started the attack with a bombardment of the new grenades which tore them apart. The paladins led the charge, and we moved in to destroy them. While this was happening, the hind began its attack on the noble's district. We loaded its deck with as many casters as it could hold. I just wish that I could have seen it in action. I can only use my imagination, unfortunately. I was, instead, on the ground battling the undead. We managed to put the defensive force down and started tearing at the main gates until we broke through. The city beyond wasn't so much a city anymore. Everything was in ruin, and of course, there were more undead to deal with. They came at us, tirelessly for hours, trying to push us out while we pushed back and repositioned. Avery was holding up well, even with no divine power. She was tearing the enemy apart with her mace, shattering bones and skulls as they came at her. Then it started. Two hours in, Avery suddenly recoiled back. By the time I got to her, she had recovered. She told me that she had done it, and just like that, her holy aura lit up again, except it was blue instead of the old sunny yellow. Four exhausting hours later, the undead stopped their push and started pulling back for the castle. We all took some time to regain our breath. The hind had completed its mission. The noble's district was in a burning ruin. Not a single building was left standing aside from the castle, which seemed impervious to the spells being thrown at it. The hind then tried attacking the giant figure, but spells were just passing through it. With our way clear, our clerics and paladins tried tossing their holy spells at it, but nothing was happening. It's like it's not here yet. We're taking a short break, and then we're going to go sack the castle. Maybe putting down the necromancers will make that thing go away. Avery is in good spirits again, with her divine power renewed. No one suffered an injury that couldn't be healed by the clerics. Broken bones, cuts and bruises, but no dismemberment, thank God. Journal Entry 324 We entered the nobles' district. Any surviving nobles or staff seen trying to escape the district were captured, interrogated, and executed. I found out why this happened. The king was a lich. Over time, he converted the other noble families into various other undead loyal to him. He had subverted higher-up members of the local church and guilds as well. When the orc forces started winning the battles, the king started losing it and started all of this just to keep his seat of power. To keep his crown, he turned the kingdom into the land of the undead had all his subjects killed and made into a form more loyal to him. By the time we got to the castle, the undead had formed a defensive wall. We began our attack on the castle. The hind did an opening strafing run on the wall of undead, blocking the entrance with what spells the casters could put out, followed by a grenade bombardment. Then we went in. Avery unexpectedly led the charge, inspiring the paladins and clerics right behind her. She did her supernova trick, though rather than burn, the undead were physically pushed back while the living, well, we felt like nothing could stop us, and emotional and reinforcement of some kind. It helped. We tore apart the undead and pressed into the castle and began clearing it floor by floor. The first floor only had a few wandering undead. The force started splitting up to cover as much of the castle as possible. Us Terrans stuck together, of course. After the first floor, we started running into the necromancers, something I can affect. 
Any that we came across was dead before they could toss their first spell. I learned of their magic traps from their mind, and Jason disabled them somehow. We eventually made it to the throne room, and met up with the other soldiers. The doors all had some magic force field over them. With most of our casters on the hind, dispelling them wasn't an option. So we improvised. We called up the grenadiers and rigged up a bomb. It wasn't enough to outright destroy the wall, but it shattered the stone enough that we could break through with brute force of some of the stronger soldiers with us. Then we flooded the throne room. It was probably a bad idea. The king slash lich was in some ceremony circle, surrounded by unmoving necromancers. Or maybe they were undeath clerics. Whatever. He didn't say a thing. No monologue, no death threats. He just unleashed his greatest spells and tore us apart as fast as we could come in. All of us except the clerics and paladins. They were fighting back with their divine spells, burning him, but they were falling one at a time. I couldn't touch the mind of the lich, but I could tear through the necromancers around him. They weren't even all there anymore. Puppets. But they did have memories. I found where his phylactery was. His crown. The idiot was wearing it. I told Avery, but she couldn't move to act on it. And the rest of us were dead and dying. Then, just like that, the MP3 golem wandered in and started blasting Love Shack. It distracted the lich enough for Avery to lash out and shatter his crown with her mace. The rest of the surviving clerics and paladins pounced for the kill, but were blown back when he lit up like an evil beacon, killing his circle of necromancers. I think he had a hold of the undeath god's attention. The only thing keeping us from burning alive was Avery's own holy aura. They were tossing their spells at each other. Then Avery looked back at me and said goodbye. That it was time. The lich shrieked and vanished, except for a shadow burned in the wall. Then Avery simply vanished, along with the entire roof of the castle. Our wounds were gone. The dying were alive and well again. She's gone. Journal Entry 325 It's been a few days since the Battle of Wolf Lake. We're still occupying the city and have been collecting the corpses and cremating them. Looting any houses for surviving food or gear that the army can use. In a day or so we're going to march back and deal with the siege on Hebrew which is still going on. As for the God Shell, it's still here, but it has since turned to stone, possibly marble. We're going to attempt to pull it over using the hind and some chains. It should be spectacular, and hopefully not in the airship exploding spectacular. As for Avery, I've been avoiding the issue. I don't know what happened, but I touched her mind as she vanished. I can't explain what I saw there, but she was happy. I don't know if I'll ever see her again, but I miss her. There appears to be a sentence in my journal. Don't worry, we'll meet again one day, when it's time. I'll even save you a seat. Journal Entry 326 We're on the march back for Hebrew along the trade road. We should be there in three days. If the undead are still attacking, there must be some necromancers involved still. With the Hind, we have regular contact with the city at least, and a steady stream of supplies. I don't know what's going to happen with Wolf Lake. There are still mindless undead wandering around here and there, and the whole area has this creepy vibe to it. I overheard some of the clerics talking, and they're pretty sure that if the area is left as it is, it's going to just turn into a giant undead swamp. Maybe when the tribals return, they can clean it up. Knowing the region's past though, everyone is probably going to swarm in and more wars will follow. The whole place is fucking cursed. Everyone wants it, and there's nothing here worth holding on to. 
It's not even in a tactically viable location. And with the advent of cargo airships, land routes aren't as important. Well, whatever. It's land. I guess that's good enough. In other news, Marcus is working on an epic ballad with the Battle of Wolf Lake. If anything is going to make his name famous, it's that. I hope he doesn't botch it. Journal Entry 327 We've set up camp in one of the guard outposts along the trade route for the night. With any luck, we should end this war tomorrow when we put down the remnants of the undead army sieging Hebrew. We've run out of grenades, but more are being made in the city. The Hines should deliver a new batch in the morning before we leave. They work very well at blowing apart the undead, especially the ones that have been blessed. Mike's girlfriend has been trying to fill the gap that Avery left behind. It's not going to work out. Sure, she's a nice girl, as she tries, but she's no Terran. She doesn't understand most of what we're talking about. Also, what she does is the opposite of what Avery did. At least, she makes Mike happy. Journal Entry 328 We made a hard march and came to the rear flank of the remaining undead force. We had the Hind do a low aerial spellcaster bombardment, followed by grenades from both our forces and those on the Hebrew wall. We then marched in to clean up the rest of the enemy. The fight was messy. Most of the undead and their unliving siege engines were shattered or in pieces, and we had to deal with loose limbs and torsos flopping around the battlefield. We managed to put them down after a few hours work. We couldn't find the controlling necromancers right away, but managed to track them down to a cave after nightfall. Their campfire illumination gave them away. They surrendered, rather than put up a fight. They are currently being hanged by order of command. After all of this, I can't blame them. I picked at their minds for anything of interest. They were people who found no comfort among the living, either by choice or environment. The problem is, they went too far and never realized it. Now, they're paying the price. Us Terrans could very well overstep the line in the same way in our arrogance. I'll have to be careful. Journal Entry 329 The celebration has turned into a full-blown festival. Wine, music, food, plays, and dancing. Marcus is doing his stage performance. He finished his war ballad and has been pretty popular so far. Mike and his girl ran off on their own, possibly to summon demons. Austin, Max, and Jason got lucky. We were all having a relatively good time. Well, they were. I was having a hard time getting into it. What with another of our numbers gone? Even if Avery wasn't killed, she's no longer with us. Rather than sit and mope, I drop the barriers and let the celebration consume me. Most of it is a blur and I still have this hangover. But I woke up with most of my clothes missing and another tattoo on my other arm. It's the radiation symbol. <laughs> what the fuck? To make matters worse, people keep giving me odd looks of recognition. The others won't talk about it but get a bemused expression. There's going to be some mind rape soon if I don't get answers. Journal Entry 330 Apparently, after challenging some dwarves to a drinking contest, I went on stage and told the tale known back home as Big Trouble in Little China. The kids loved it. New rule. No more opening the gates at celebrations. Anyways, the refugees have started returning to Wolf Lake. We're going to hang around town a few more days, and if nothing else is going on, return to Alien. We have gotten our mercenary pay and have been discharged from the war. For the moment, the continent is at peace, until at least tomorrow when the city is expecting a congress of local kingdoms who will decide the fate of Wolf Lake. All that remain of that kingdom are peasants and tribals. It'd be nice if they gave the area to the tribals, but I doubt that's going to happen. They like men in castles wearing crowns to be in control. Not orcs and furs or wild elves wearing whatever they woke up laying in. It's a political situation that hasn't occurred in centuries. We may stick around just to see what goes on. In the meantime, the hind is shuttling passengers back and forth between here. Rosenbridge and Amefield, and making a nice tidy profit. Journal Injury 331 
Jason comes and grabs me out of bed all excited about something. It's barely sun up, and he's pushing me to a window and pointing up into the air above the city. I don't see a damn thing except blinding sunlight. After he manages to calm down and I manage to wake up some, he explains. He sees an airship hovering above town. No one else does. I'm willing to take his word for it. I try reading out and sure enough, I can detect thought floating above the city. At least 15 people. Some kind of invisibility spell, I'm guessing. I didn't detect hostility. So I figured it belonged to one of the representatives and they were just checking things out before landing. I put the incident out of my mind and went and had breakfast. A few hours later, it's still there. I ended up grabbing Jason and headed over to the hind to inform our pilot, Marika, of it so she doesn't have the world's first midair collision and when she takes off for a trading run. Then he showed up, an unassuming sun priest with a staff. He wandered over and started asking questions. Who owned this airship? Who made it? Who made the modifications and so on? I may have figured the guy is just a curious priest with an interest for airships, except that his staff looks suspiciously like a long rifle with a sun church symbol sticking out of the barrel. Jason noticed too, from the sudden change of his stance. He had a very guarded mind, enough so that I couldn't have dived in without him noticing and resisting. So I made myself clear. I drew my pistol on him. Most people here wouldn't know what it was. I saw recognition in his eyes. Before I could make my demand of him to explain himself, he fired off some blinding light. By the time I recovered, he was gone, and Jason said the airship was starting to pull away, heading north. I would have had the hind give chase if we were all here, but we're scattered around town. We're going to resupply and head off after them. Journal Entry 332 we're loaded with supplies and hauling ass northward, the general direction Jason saw the airship go. This might be a wild goose chase since only Jason can see it and we don't have any way to track it. According to the map, if it continued in this direction, it should pass near Airedale. Austin seems to think that airships might leave a magic emission trail behind them as working below decks into making some kind of magic tracking lens. If we don't see anything by the time we reach Airedale's borders, we're going to turn around and head back. Probably just return to Aeon. In other news, winter is coming. This brings about problems such as how to stay warm on the airship, how to heat the below decks without starting an uncontrollable fire, and dealing with ice buildup on deck. Speaking of that, I think we're at or near our second year anniversary here. We've come a long way, baby. Journal Entry 333 We made it to Airedale, best known for its guardocracy, hey, my kind of town, and ticketing a horse because of its shoes. We arrived around midnight and landed outside the city limits due to their stupid laws for the night. Austin finished his tracking lens. It's a small circular lens he connected to a frame so it can be worn over an eye. While looking through it, airships leave behind a colored trail based on the Pacific, Pacific, specific spells used for their propulsion. The hinds are green. We don't see any others in the area, which means we lost a trail. We're not even going to bother to visit this hellhole. We're just going to take off come morning and head for Aeon. It should be a three day ride and if we have any problems, we'll be passing near Wild Lake and New Chicago. Jason has become our new official backup pilot and flies the night shift because of his eye. We drew straws, and I am next in line to learn how to fly this thing, followed by Alex. So my days now begin with me hanging out near our lovely pilot. I hope Jason doesn't get jealous. Journal Entry 334 Flying an airship isn't that difficult, you know, until you want to turn or anything. I don't suppose it helps that our airship has all these extra controls for the flaps, ailerons, and canards that Austin installed. The most difficult part though, standing in one spot. All day. Yeah, that's real fun. I have our pilot looking over my shoulder the whole time, which to be honest, I really need. One wrong move and we crash and burn. Speaking of crashing and burning, our mains went out. Austin got them up while the auxiliaries did their job. That's two times those things have saved our asses so far. 
After our pilot took over, we broke up my Kindle and we all watched Strange Days. It's been a while. Marcus started joking that he had been thinking of how to convert the movie into a play for a while now. We egged him on for a while about doing it, but he doesn't want to be a theater writer, just a bard. A bard married to a dragon. A dragon with her hands in his pockets, and only for the money that's in them. At least, that's how I see it. I know they love each other and all that, it's just that she needs to learn her place amongst us. It certainly is an overlord, that's for damn sure. Journal Entry 335 We passed over New Chicago today. I snapped some photos from the air as he passed overhead. It looks like the kobolds got two more buildings up and their farms look to be in respectable shape. Good for them. Hopefully they'll pack enough food for the coming winter. Maybe in a decade or two, Agen will have kobold adventures checking into the university. Anyways, we landed in Alien just before nightfall. Marcus ran off to see his wife while the rest of us checked into the inn. While unpacking the airship, I found Avery's laptop. I decided to go through it. We knew that technical info she already had, and we had been through her music. I found detailed documentation on her condition as a cleric. What it was like to touch the divine, to call forth a spell, the auras, and all of that. Almost as if she was trying to logically delineate the divine. I'm sure the university would love to see some of this. Then there were detailed documents on the Sun Church's organization. What history she managed to pick up. Tenets and prayers. I still don't know what happened to her. Or where she went. But I know she is watching over us from... Wherever that place is. Journal Entry 336 I paid a visit to the Sun Church today. They deserved to know what happened. I told them all. Everything. I even showed a few of them that wanted to see. When I left, they were all in prayer. Some of them believe she's ascended to her own divine throne. Others think she's now the right hand of the Sun God. While a few think she simply died. Maybe they'll get their answers from their God. Anyways, I dropped off some things at the university when Raina showed up. She invented an interest rate based on how long Marcus is away from home, combined with how dangerous the adventure is. What does she even need all this fucking money for anyways? She's already living better than the average person in the city, which is already more advanced than most cities out there. They have bikes and sewers for fuck's sake. So, my options were clear. Erase my existence from her mind. Punch her, or we go somewhere nice and have a long talk. The first two options mm, would have been the most satisfying. Oh, so satisfying. Instead, we went and had a nice talk at the cafe with some coffee. There was some snarling involved. The dragon perspective is an odd one. They love their wealth, and wealth isn't always money or jewels. Once she had figured out what we were, she decided that us Terrans were part of her treasure hoard, and that lately, we weren't working hard enough to make her money pile even bigger. Her naive expectations were that we'd be throwing fistfuls of money at her. Joyful to have a dragon in our midst because she's a dragon, while she protects us from the world with her dragonness. She didn't take my rebuke well. I'm probably going to get a visit from Marcus in an hour or so about it. Fucking dragons. Journal Entry 337. We had a cold front come in today. I had to pay a visit to the market to buy some winter clothes to deal with it. Anyways, hung out at the university with Jason and Austin. The master artificer managed to build a miniature steam train that runs a ring around the campus. It looks like those kitty rides you find at a big mall around Christmas, except it has a small chance of exploding, sending boiling hot water and steam everywhere. He assures us that's not likely to happen, but that's what they say about airship engines failing. Now that we have a working prototype, he's trying to sell the idea to the quarry owners in the new Department of Transportation in the city that was founded recently to deal with all the bikes. Aside from that, he also has two working printing presses with movable type. One is for actual use, the other, he's trying to make work by voice command, but is having trouble with grammar and dialects. 
Short of inventing a magical computer of some kind, he's probably not going to succeed at it. While we were there, Austin got a letter from our favorite shifter air captain. The Celestial Rose's repairs have been completed while we were off fighting a war, and Austin has been requested to trick it out for a tidy profit. Maybe after that, we can have a racing rematch if we can kick his ass again. Journal Entry 338 We finally got our own place. It was an old two-story inn that closed down recently, which would suit our space requirements. We did a thorough check of the structure. Made sure it wasn't about to collapse. Made sure it wasn't haunted. Made sure it had the resources we need like its own sewer and well access before we bought it. We we're in the process of moving in and cleaning it up. Austin is making some magic lighting for the rooms and Jason, Mike, and Max are out picking up some furniture. I'm on cleaning duty with the rest. We have finally accepted Mike's warlock girlfriend, Cherry, into our little group and she's helping out. Once we get the place cleaned up, we're going to see if we can't invent indoor plumbing, or at least a magic variant. In other news, the Hind is running cargo between Aeon and Brightly again. Reyna wanted to start micromanaging our side shipping business, but I don't trust her with our money. Sure, she wouldn't outright steal. She'd come up with some silly dragon taxes or flying reptile interest rates instead. Journal Entry 339 So I got up this morning, and I'm feeling really good. and happened to be the first one up, so I decided to make breakfast for everyone. Oatmeal porridge with cinnamon and blueberry preserves. Jason comes down and just gives me the weirdest look and shakes his head and takes a bowl. I figure it's because it's the fact I'm making food. Typically, Alex, Ian, or Marcus do the cooking. The others start coming down and they're giving me weird looks too. Then I realize that I left my body upstairs. I've been detached the whole time. Apparently, I can pick up stuff now when I'm detached. I'm going to have to keep an eye on this. How could I not notice? Anyways, Marcus talked to me into babysitting little Nathan while they run off and have a romantic evening together. What do dragons consider romantic? Swimming in money like Uncle Scrooge style? Anyways, the baby's been good. Rainus kept him shape-shifted in his half-elf form this whole time. God knows what he really looks like. Like I said, he's been good. Not that he has a choice with me keeping his mind from wanting to make a fuss. Ah, yes. Scions make the best babysitters. Journal Entry 340 Jason comes running into the house and drags me outside by force and points in the sky. The invisible airship is over Aeon. The hind is out of town. We grab Alex, Cherry, and Ian and beeline for the Sun Church. Nope. No strange priests here. So we make for the university. Sure enough, there's that asshole with the long rifle watching the steam train ring around the campus. I didn't even give him a chance. I mind-locked him soon as he was in range. He put up a fight, but fuck that noise. I hit him with enough juice that I lit my hair on fire. After putting out the flames, we dragged him inside for a nice little chat, without words. Well, he is in fact a priest of the Sun Church, but from a branch from a mostly isolated foreign city across the desert. It's his job to go around in their invisible airship and keep tabs on technological growth. He's the one that sent the cannon ingredients to Wolf Lake. He gave Winterfield plans for the mortar and was going to deliver cannon plans to Hebrew, but we ended the war before he could. He does it to keep established civilized cities civilized. After the situation was resolved, he was going to return a few months later and erase that knowledge. He came here to look into sudden technological developments and limit their growth by force, if need be. He also knows what we are. Before I could get more out of him, he up and vanished, spy master style. Jason ran outside and sure enough, the invisible airship was leaving. Well. Soon as the hind returns, we'll go pay him a visit. I know where he lives now. Journal Entry 341 The hind is back in town. We're picking up supplies and we're going to head out to Mandan, then the desert. 
We're making sure to pack plenty of water, and we're bringing enough ingredients to make one ton of black powder and several containers to put it in. Reyna has demanded to come along this time, and she's bringing the baby. She doesn't care how dangerous this could be. She's tired of sitting at home while we go gallivanting around the continent. I bet she's just worried that we'll find mountains of gold in the desert and not tell her. Austin is bringing a load of artificing gear. He's planning on working on a ship cloak on the way. See how they like having an invisible airship hovering above their city. So what do we know about this desert city? Very little. It does little trade with the outside world, mainly due to the difficulty of getting there. It must be self-sufficient to manage this. Getting there, even for us, is going to be some trouble. My map doesn't cover that part of the continent. All I know are from memories I ripped out of that priest, and that's mostly landmarks and a general direction. We should be alright though. If all else fails, we have Reyna to comfort us. Journal Entry 342 We're in the air. It started snowing soon as we lifted off. I was on first pilot duty. Piloting an airship in the snow sucks. By the time my shift was up, I went below decks, all my facial hair was iced. The deck is getting iced up pretty bad too. If I recall, the way they do it back home is the same way they do it here. Clubs and brooms. We should be in Mandan by tomorrow, and we can take a break to defrost the ship if it doesn't warm up by then. In the meantime, Jason brought a deck of cards with him he picked up at the market. They're all different from the cards back home, almost more like tarot cards, but we're trying to adapt them into a game of poker. Our first few games ended hilariously, and we're not sure who won. Cherry has decided to teach us how to play the game the cards are used for. It's similar to blackjack, except the face cards have a value based on the person sitting next to you and you're trying to reach 200 instead of 21. It was a good time sink, I guess. Journal Entry 343 We made Mandan and their airship was hogging up the only air dock, so we had to use our landing struts. Well, what a surprise. Our landing struts were stuck. A few of us had to rope down out of the airship and unfreeze them so they could lower properly. The good news is that the snow stopped finally, but it's still cold. We're spending the night at an inn and leaving in the morning. I checked around the market for any deals on Dorvin made goods and picked up a new short sword for a pretty good deal. So a few things about those memories I tore out of the priest have been bothering me. Clearly, they're keeping a hold on technology and keeping it to themselves. But why? They're isolationists. Or is that the reason why? to keep the rest of the world from bothering them. How long has that city been out there? Was it from the last group of Terrans or ones before that? While I was in the market, I checked around for anything on the city across the desert. Well, apparently every now and then, someone in the merchant guild gets it in his head that he'll make a fortune starting a trade route out there only to find that they don't want any of their produced goods and end up losing most of his fortune. It's become kind of a merchant guild morality story for your reach exceeding your grasp and knowing your customer base. Journal Entry 344 Clear skies as far as the eye can see. A bit chilly, but great airship weather. So we're over the desert and hauling ass when Ian comes up from below, takes a good look and asks where the mountains are. Well, the nearest mountain is Zebron in the Dwarven Range to the southwest a few days. Otherwise, the landscape looks pretty flat aside from the occasional dunes. Ian starts throwing a hissy fit, saying that the landscape doesn't make sense, that there should be a lot of mountains around to keep rain clouds out of the area. Otherwise, the area should be plains or a forest. I'm not entirely sure what he's going on about, but it summed up that he thought the area wasn't quite right. I, I don't know deserts. I used to live near the ocean. In other news, the MP3 Golem is apparently on the ship. I haven't heard from it since the Battle of Wolf Lake, but I hear Celine Dion coming from somewhere. That little bitch. Wait, they used to be Mike's player. Why did he have Celine Dion? I'm going to have to have a talk with him. Again. Journal Entry 345 we found an oasis today and made a short stop to replenish our water supplies. I'm not sure how much longer we have to go, but it can't hurt to be prepared. We did find the remains of an old wagon nearby. 
It looks like its wheels had shattered. Possibly remains of an old trade caravan. It didn't have anything of value. Mox and Ian tore it apart and made it into some kind of marker. We all signed her names, the earth date and the local date on it. Even Raina. She didn't quite get why we had her do it, but chances are that she's still going to be alive when this thing's disintegrated. Maybe by then she'll have learned some manners. Speaking of the Earth date, if the last group of Terrans left around the time of the date stamp on the photos they left behind in their SD card, they would have been portaled off into the past three days ago. I'd wish them the best of luck except, well, we already have a general idea of how well they did. Journal Entry 346 We found the last landmark that I've been looking for. A river. We were falling in at a pretty good clip. Typically you'd expect rivers to be surrounded by plant life, but not this one. You'd expect the sand to have consumed it otherwise, but Jason says it looks artificial. Its depth is too even. A few hours later, we spotted a city in the distance. We engage Austin's cloaking device and go up in altitude. Marika takes the controls and we all go to see what we can see. It's all enclosed. Aside from Zebron, this must be the largest city on the continent. It's designed like a layer cake, each level smaller than the one below with a massive tower in the center. There was no farmland around it, no plant life around it in fact. The only green was coming from the city inside. Trees and open air parks, plants on balconies and so on. This may be an arcology. We counted five airships puttering around above it. These airships weren't designed like flying boats. They're all enclosed except for a small upper balcony. We have done several passes over the city, trying to get a good look at it. So far, we haven't been detected. Or if we have, they haven't done anything about it. We did spot something interesting. On the ground level, near the river, there's a large cement pad near one of the entrances with a typical air dock of the style seen in other cities. Like they were expecting a standard airship to come out here one day. We're going to move back out of visual range and land for the night. Head in during the day acting like traitors and see what happens. We can pull it off. We even have a ton of ingredients in the hold. Journal Entry 347 We did our best to hide our tech and went in for a landing at the city air dock. Some people came out to greet us dressed in simple clothes. Three of them were human, the rest were elves. Elves that looked like they were the same sub-race as the Ryan Graf Spymaster. They were casually armed with disguised long rifles and would look like matchlock pistols tucked into their belts. We introduced ourselves as traders from Mandan, braving the desert waste to open a trade route and look at all the alchemy stuff we have. We found out what the name of the city is. New Paris, City of Light. Well, we know who founded it now. I didn't detect anything distrustful of them, though they were considering us peasant scum who weren't too pleased that we arrived in an airship. We told them that this was a merchant guild expedition, and that they were waiting for our return, successful or not. They called out one of their merchants, a sun cleric. He looked over our ingredients, shrugged and said we had nothing he wanted. He did take an interest in our airship though, started asking questions about it while we casually prodded him for information. Why was a Sun Church cleric acting as a merchant? Well, apparently the Sun Church runs things in the City of Light. It's considered the holy capital of the church, except apparently only a handful of people across the desert even know it exists. We were invited in to see if they had anything we had wanted to buy. He led us to what I'm pretty sure was a city garbage dump. Old pieces of equipment, rusted junk, old clothes, and so on. We picked through it for a few minutes, pretending to be interested but ultimately turned him down. We asked if he could stay in the city for a few days. We had traveled a long way and needed some rest. He considered for a few minutes before agreeing. We made our way into the city. It wasn't as advanced as I had figured. It looked like Aeon and maybe 20 years if they embraced everything we threw at them. It's all an eclectic mix of magic technology and medieval design ideals with some early steampunk mixed in maybe. We were held up for the night in an apartment near the city exit with a bunch of cots our guide had brought in. We have running water, bathroom facilities with sewage access, and what he called a food tube. 
It distributes a mint flavored paste with a consistency of mashed potatoes that the locals apparently eat. It was horrible. It better not be processed dead people. Our guide made it clear that he doesn't want us wandering the city. His reasoning was that we didn't know the laws and didn't want us getting in trouble or hurting ourselves. How nice. Jason's going to sneak out soon and take a good look around. Journal Entry 348 Well, while Jason was out, a certain sun priest burst into our room with guards, points at us dramatically and yells, Terrans! If we had Avery with us, we'd have fought back. But none of us want to deal with the long-term effects of musket wounds. Plus, we have a baby with us. So, we have been taken prisoner. We were taken through the city to another area that was more or less had the same facilities as the last room, just bars on the door. They sorted through our gear and ran off with our tech and the questioning began. They brought in a scion interrogator, an elf. I volunteered first. He didn't expect it. He was trained to go through memories, carefully, like pages of a book, while I was trained to mind rape and dominate. He started asking questions while starting his subtle mental penetration. He wanted to know how long we've been here, what we had been doing, what technologies we had given out, and so on. Instead, I grabbed him like a rag doll and made him tell me everything without saying a word. This city was founded 800 years ago by Terrans and a local tribe of desert elves that worship the sun, but not the sun god. They believe that the Terrans came from the sun and worship them as well. They use their loyal population to start building this city. From what I gather, they were trying to make this the center of learning and keep it isolated enough to stay out of the wars. We may be looking at the future of Aegon here. The locals are descendants of Terrans, the tribals and adventurers that made the journey here. When the last of the Terrans died, the influx of new ideas stopped dead and things stagnated until 400 years ago when some of that batch of Terrans made their way here to found a new sun church and try and bring the city out of its isolation. The locals still worshipped the sun and had no problem converting but realized that these people were like their founders. Their knowledge was taken from them by force, and they were used as breeding stock. 200 years ago, another group showed up and were immediately picked up by Parisian spies before they could make an impression on the world and followed the same fate as the others. They're planning on doing the same with us. Around the time the guards were starting to get suspicious, their necks exploded in a shower of blood. Jason had managed to find us and intercepted our stolen goods. I erased the interrogator's mind and we did a jailbreak. We are currently holed up in some guy's apartment. I convinced him that we're relatives. He's incapable of acting against us right now. We're currently working out what we're going to do next. Journal Entry 349 Jason, Marcus, and I went out on recon. We put on some clothes that the apartment owner had, stripped his mind of local customs, and we went out. Jason had something he had spotted on his earlier tour of the city in the central hub. We found what appeared to be a museum. A museum of earth tech behind glass. Most of it was broken or damaged in some way, had been sitting for centuries. MP3 players, tablets, cell phones, guns with no ammo, and other weapons. Simpler things like toothbrushes, bottles, and wallets. Everything labeled and dated. Everything stolen from previous groups. Technology they couldn't understand but were hoping to one day. I called the guard over and made him unlock some of the cases. We took what we deemed useful or repairable and left the rest. I erased the missing items from the guard's mind so he wouldn't suspect. Memories of seeing us, and we left. We ended up with two smartphones of a type that wasn't made yet when we left. One pair of sunglasses, two pistols, a Walther P99, which may be able to use the same bullets as mine, but needs desperate attention in an HK Mark 23 with no ammo and a good old Mossberg shotgun with no ammo. We'll see if we can't fix that once we get out of this mess. Currently, Austin is trying to fix up the other 9mm pistol while we're having another meal of mint paste from a food tube. 
We're going to do another recon once the city enters its night cycle. Journal Entry 350 Jason has a new pistol and it's got a full magazine. We don't know if Austin's maintenance worked. Not that we can test it without drawing a lot of attention. The city guards have taken notice of our shenanigans and have been doing regular patrols, warnings for strange people acting strangely and so on. We're being extra cautious. We took a tour of the lower sections of the city to find any faults. Anything we can take advantage of but found nothing obvious. We're figuring that the best way to bring this city down is to sabotage various systems around like the food tube or the sewer system and water supply. But the place is just too big to destroy. We don't even know what their contingency plan is or if they even have any. Unleashing Reyna would be an option, but I don't think she'd get far before they manage to put her down. If all else fails, we'll just start assassinating leadership from the top down and hope they don't have regenerative capabilities like a certain spy master. Journal Entry 351 A few of us managed to get into the food processing center of the city, where the paste crap is made. Well, it's not dead people, but it's not a whole lot better. They're magically converting the sewage waste into ingredients that they then mechanically process and distribute through the food tube system. Sure. It's efficient and green, but I don't think I could ever get used to something like this. Whose idea was this anyways? We had brought Austin along with us on this expedition, leaving Marcus behind. There were some guards around the facility, but I got them to fight each other using jealousy over a girlfriend that doesn't exist, and we finished them off. Austin started tearing apart some equipment he figured would be difficult to replace. We then set everything on fire and quickly left. We had made it to the central hub with about a minute to spare before the guards came rushing in. There must be a silent alarm system somewhere if they responded that quickly. Journal Entry 352 We had a guard come to the door today. I sent him away believing that nothing was wrong. They're doing door-to-door -door searches, level by level. We packed up and moved immediately. If anyone trained in memory examination takes a good look, they might see the changes. I have convinced a resident of this house that he is a freedom fighter and will deal with the enemy appropriately. We moved across town, moving as separate groups of no more than three until we scattered out a house and moved in. Another single individual who now thinks he's always lived with all of us, and it's perfectly normal, and most importantly, he's already been questioned and searched. From our earlier attack, the food tube system has shut down completely. The arcology criers have been announcing that it will be fixed soon and not to panic. They continue to look for us. Once we get settled, we'll continue our expeditions and sabotage. Journal Entry 353 We made it to the water plant. It's set up on top of the arcology and uses gravity for water distribution. Simple system. Water is created magically from thin air, more or less. The guards up here were all sporting anti-telethopy headbands. I guess they caught on. That didn't stop us from killing them. Jason went first, snuck up and murdered the shit out of one of the guards. The rest of us launched our attack. They couldn't get their guns up in time before we stab them. We kept one alive, which I interrogated, while Austin tore apart the water system. The city is relatively peaceful, and the guards aren't used to dealing with terrorist attacks or adventures. They're adapting, but slowly. They were under the impression that we would all be naive and helpless. Maybe we would have been if we were brought here in the early days. Jason was collecting their weapons when he had a realization. All the guns are muzzle loaders. Sure enough, each guard had its own powder and a small belt pouch. I convinced the guard that he was on our side and that he had to kill anyone else trying to come into this room, even at the cost of his own life, for the cause. We left him with all the muskets. Journal Entry 354 I grabbed a book from the apartment we've been staying in and went alone to the floor above, went into that level's park and found a nice seat with a view. I ordered every passing person to hunt down and attack the nearest guard or government official one floor above this one or sabotage something important. I read the book in between all of this. Every now and then I would hear a gunshot or screaming in panic. I figured this was the easiest way to seed panic. They can't give out anti-scion headbands to everyone after all. 
I'm sure this has me sliding down that alignment scale again. I could almost feel Avery's disapproving look on my back. After four hours, I wrapped up and headed back to the apartment. While I was causing that distraction, Jason, Austin, and Ian headed back into the food processing center and sabotaged their repair attempts and filled a few containers with food for use back at base since our supply was starting to run low. Journal Entry 355 Our electronics detected a Wi-Fi signal. A few minutes later, there was knocking on the door. They found us. Those assholes developed some kind of fine Wi-Fi enabled devices spell. There were about 30 of them outside. They demanded our surrender, promised that we wouldn't be hurt, that they wanted us in protective custody for the time being, that they wanted to talk. We didn't have much of a choice, not without undue risk. Jason shut off his iPod and hid it with both working pistols while we took the house resident as one of us. We surrendered into their custody. We had our weapons taken from us and were all taken to one of the higher levels, a large atrium with a dinner table set up. We were told to have a seat. The guards stayed but kept their weapons ready. After a few minutes, three people came out in fancy dresses, two elves, and one human. They were wearing those scion headbands, of course. The elves stayed quiet, but the human spoke. He was the son of one of the founding Terrans. He was one of the first born in the city, and eventually became its immortal leader. We had a long talk over breakfast, real food for a change. His father and mother had been taken away in the summer of 2017 and thrust into a situation we were all familiar with. There were six Terrans total. They had similar experiences, similar adventures, and eventually made their way out here to deal with some great evil. The cause of the desert. The death of an evil avatar whose death blighted the region for hundreds of miles, turned it into a desert. They ran into the tribes and settled with them while they were covered and eventually were worshipped as gods. This group's ambition was to make each kingdom self-sufficient to end the wars but no one was listening. Here, they would listen, so they built New Paris. It took centuries to get to this point, and it's still being built. From what I gather, the group never stepped down from their power, even after the population became civilized. They got used to the power they had, it's understandable. Then they started dying, one at a time, of old age. Lucas declared himself the king, being the only one of the first generation born here that was pure-blooded, and continued building the city in the vision of his parents and their companions. When he got old, he had a ritual performed. He's a lich of some kind. He has some kind of sustaining magic keeping his body alive, or at least alive looking. So where did it go wrong? He didn't have the knowledge. The city was built from the plans left behind, and then no one knew what else to do. So they had just lived here and developed an isolationist policy. A few centuries later, another group of Terrans, the church founders, arrived. They were welcomed, but when they didn't dump everything, they were taken prisoner and mine raped by scions for everything. Advancement began. New ideas and new directions to take things, but those ran dry fast enough. They had the church infrastructure to take advantage of now, though, and used it to try and nudge the rest of the continent into developing for them. After which, they'd jump on it and try and suppress it afterwards so that they would always stay ahead of the game. The rest of the continent is their R&D lab but their methods are screwing them over in the long run. Then they lucked out and caught the next group of Terrans a few days after they arrived. I already noted how that turned out. They weren't given a chance. So, because we've proven ourselves, we have been given the option. We could serve under Lucas and live to advance this place, or he'll take it from us by force. I reached out to everyone and got consensus. I leaned forward and told Lucas that Reyna was a dragon. After she finished killing all of the guard, Reyna had to withdraw from the fight through the atrium glass roof. She had been injured from the gunfire and spells being shut off. She took the baby and Marika with her. We were launching everything at Lucas and he was fighting back hard. 
The entire section was starting to collapse. Jason showed up and shot the elven assistants from behind. They had been doing most of the shielding and counterspelling. We put Lucas down after that. We didn't know where his phylactery was, but it was time to go. We managed to escape into one of the lower levels and have hidden in another apartment for now until we plan our next move. I'm not sure if Raina got out okay with the baby and Marika, but she definitely earned her pay today. Journal Entry 356 The city is in chaos right now. The atrium level has fully collapsed into the floor below it, cutting it off from the upper levels. The guards are on high alert and outright shooting anyone that they think even looks suspicious. We've just been taking it easy in the apartment. We don't know how long it will take Lucas to regenerate, but we need to find his phylactery and destroy it. Put an end to him or he'll just rebuild when we're gone and pick up right where he left off. After everyone's rested up, we're going to fight our way up and try and reach the upper levels. We have injuries from last night and the only thing we have on hand to deal with it are a few light cure potions we found in the apartment. They taste like cough syrup. We could have really used Avery for this. Journal Entry 357 We have barricaded ourselves in the royal suite. It was a tough fight up here. Since most of the guards have their scion headbands, I became the distraction. I'd detach and flying at them acting all ghost-like. They'd panic and fire. Then the rest of the team had a minute to kill them before they could reload. It's a big assumption that the phylactery is up here. It may be below the city, or outside the city. It could be in Rosenbridge for all we know. The suite is at the highest point in the city. It's well fortified, and only has one entrance outside of the balcony that rings it. The guards have tried breaching the door for an hour before giving up. I'm not sure what they're doing out there, but if they were smart, they'd be putting together a bomb and blast their way in. Max has been casually slinging spells over the balcony at the city below, causing more section collapses and outbreaks of fire. The only problem is that he's burning himself out fast from doing it. From the looks of it, Reyna shot down the city airships, as you can see their wreckage littering the city's superstructure. No sign of our airship or the dragon as of yet. Mike and Cherry have been setting up a summoning circle. They're going to try and get us some demonic assistance. Journal Entry 358 Lucas is back. I can hear him screaming curses at us from outside. We've ransacked his quarters pretty hard for anything we could use. We found a barely working, magically enhanced Android tablet that desperately needed a format, an airsoft effing file, and a block of what we all agree is ancient sim text that we're pretty sure is no longer any good after all these centuries. It's not even malleable anymore. In case it is. Austin's rigging up a magical detonator and we're dumping it in the sewer system, which seems to still be flowing, just in case. The airsoft gun appears to be modified. It can fire a magic missile about once a minute. As for our demon assistants, since we're not willing to sell souls or have a baby on hand to sacrifice, the best we can get is a messenger imp. We're sending it off to alert Marika who presumably has our airship, as to where we are. Journal Entry 359 Lucas breached our defenses. Well, he more went around them. He got outside and just flew around onto the balcony. He's been fluctuating between begging and threats all day, but currently he's in a begging mode. He just wants us to leave. He promised he'll never bother us again and keep his hands off the rest of the continent until we're dead of old age. We told him we'd consider it, and that's what we're doing right now. He's left and gone back downstairs while we figure this out. I figure that he's just going to stab us in the back the second he can. He's not entirely stable, especially since what we've done to his city. Even if he holds up the deal, the next group of Terrans is going to be fucked over, and the ones after that, and so on like the ones before us. I feel we need to do something, even if it's just for their revenge. Lucas needs to pay for what he's done, what he's doing, and what he's going to do, and I'll bring this whole civilization down with him if I have to. At least, that's my stance on it. We're still discussing it. The Hines returned to us and has landed on the balcony. They took to hiding a few miles away behind some dunes while the heat died down and Raina recovered. 
She's got some scars, even on her elven form, but nothing too dramatic. Marcus is proud of her. The babies come out of all of this unscathed, as has Marika. We're including their input on the decision. They're not Terrans, but they've thrown themselves in with us. They should have a voice too. Journal Entry 360 We made our decision. We moved our bomb ingredients off the hind and mixed them. It took a few hours, but when we are done, we had our one ton bomb in a five minute fuse. We would run, for now. But we were going to leave a parting gift. We had a five minute fuse set up. We drew straws as to who would light it. I got the short straw, so I had to light it. I was given a torch from below deck. We made sure everything we wanted was on the ship and everyone was ready to pull out. Then I walked over and lit the fuse. I made it two steps away when suddenly the Rhine Graf spy master appeared and stabbed me through the gut. From the shock, I dropped the torch on the bomb crate. I think they knew what was going to happen. I saw the airship suddenly lift off and shoot into the sky. I grabbed the spy master with all my remaining strength. I figured the explosion would be enough to destroy its enchantments once and for all. Then the bomb went off and I died. Well, my body did anyways. The explosion caused a chain reaction of collapses. The upper half of the arcology collapsed in on itself. The city was evacuated. I was in a daze for a few hours before I realized what had happened. I'm detached now, permanently. I spotted the hinds circling the ruins and managed to flag them down, and here I am. Everyone is kind of in shock, and so am I. I don't feel anything. Journal Entry 361 It's been a few days. We've been camped out around New Paris watching the survivors. There hasn't been any sign of Lucas. We think that maybe the city was his phylactery, and we have effectively destroyed it. The locals, with our help, have managed to restore some functionality to their food paste producers, have been getting water from the local river, so they aren't starving to death for now. With Lucas gone, they've been deferring to us, the next Terrans in line. They want us to take over and lead them like Lucas or his parents did. I told them that it's time to leave this cursed desert and rejoin the rest of civilization. The problem is that most cities aren't big enough to hold their population. Hell, if they crossed the desert and settled in Mandan, they'd triple its population. If they could survive the trip to Wolf Lake, maybe they could settle there. We're literally trying to figure out where to put the surviving population of one of the biggest cities on the continent. It's baffling. As for my condition, well, I don't need food, water or sleep, or much of anything else. At least I don't have to worry about my hair catching on fire though. Journal Entry 362 Austin has managed to make their food processing system more mobile and adjusted it to work with the sand. I'm not sure how nutritious it will be, but the consistency has at least improved. The surviving Sun Church leadership know the continent better than most, so they've been tasked to take care of the population and try and get it eventually to Wolf Lake. They may be able to use the river for transportation. I'm not sure where it ends, or if it connects to any other rivers, but it's flowing in the right direction. As for us, we're trying to figure out what we want to do with our lives. We're tired. Maybe it's time to retire. Mike and Cherry are probably going to settle down and summon up a family. Marcus and Raina pretty much already have. I'm pretty sure we can find something to keep ourselves occupied and alien aside from being research subjects. Maybe I can take up a teaching position and spread the advancement. Maybe get myself a new body. Maybe not. Hopefully we won't make the same mistakes that the founders of New Paris did. If we do, I can only hope that the next group manages to fix our mess. So, here we are. We were taken against our wills, forced to fight to survive. We did. We adapted and we fought back. We crushed civilizations and helped found new ones. We changed the world. We survived. We are Terrans. We will always find a way. Journal Entry dash 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 dash, or as I'm calling it, Journal Entry 369.
Oh, the last one's always so nice. 200 years, just like we predicted. The next batch of Terrans has arrived in Rosenbridge. 12 of them. They've already been here a week, struggling for food and water, living in an alleyway, dirty and terrified of the new surroundings, but not willing to lay down and die. Ah, memories. Avery and I have already made contact and gotten their trust. We had our first discussion. They arrived from late 2011, our past. Of course, this meant we had to convince them that this was unrelated to the Mayan calendar 2012 nonsense. We'll be taking them to New Chicago. We're going by train, so we have time to talk and they will have time to eat and rest. Once they've adapted to the ways of this world, maybe a few will travel to Alien and sign up at the university. I can already feel magic and psionic talents in them, struggling to express themselves. I can only wonder how they are going to change the world, what ideas and skills they've brought with them. Things may get exciting again. And that is the end, the true end of Stranded in Fantasy. Thank you guys for being along for this journey, all you thousands of listeners on Neckbeardia who stick around and watch the videos here and give us the passion that we have here on Neckbeardia to do what we do. We've been doing this for months. You've been here for months. And for that, we are grateful. We're grateful that you're here with us, listening to these silly stories. It's been an absolute pleasure narrating this story for you. So if you got the time and the drink, pause here and grab a shot. This is to you, all the listeners of Neckbeardia. If I could, I'd be there right now. And cheers you in person. Until next time, in the next story, this has been Garbro, and I'll see y'all there. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, it feels good to finish first.